Well, I'll tell you what I see happening. Uh, there is a widespread feeling in, in political circles that there's widespread failure in our public education system. So the quid pro quo is, yes, we'll give you more of what you need, but you've got to play our game in order to get it. Standards-based education, frequent testing uh, using national norms. One of the, the real wind them up, get into a Donnybrook emotional screaming match subjects across the country is social promotion. Let's talk a little bit about real kids in real classrooms who are really not ready to move on and do the next grade's work. Earlier somebody used the meta metaphor that we have a kid drowning in the middle of the river and I really like that metaphor, but um, I think all of us in this room are in the middle of the river with that kid, mm -hmm. including, <laughs> including every community, our state, other states. Where, um, I disagree that we're the second worst state in the country because I take pride in saying we're the third worst. <laughs> There's two, peop uh, two states that do worse than us, and I think it's not just the kids who are in the middle of the river, it's the whole community and we see that with our kids, we see it with our parents, we see it with our families, they're falling apart and we're waiting for politicians to not throw us a, a, a life-saving device where we want them in the river with us. We want you to feel the drowning sensation so that you scream with us and you start funding the right programs. There are great teachers out there and there's a lot of us here and I really applaud your effort to be here. And it's not just about teachers doing the right thing because we do the right thing every single day. It's about people on top who govern what we do. They need to come to our classrooms and they need to see what we do every single day. And social promotion, does it work? It works for some kids and it, it doesn't work for others. We're just gonna keep drowning in the river and I'm in that community that's drowning, so come help me with my But kids. you're a teacher in that one classroom faced with five kids, four kids, six kids, who cannot demonstrate that they've mastered the standards for that year. What do you do with that finite number of kids in your classroom? I promote that kid because what I believe has happened is we have found uh, accountability to be a way to blame who is the problem instead of accountability as to find what the problem is and f uh, find a way to solve that problem. So I will promote that child because it's not his fault mm -hmm. that my legislatures are not advocating for him and I, so I'm gonna hold my legislator. I'll flunk him before I flunk the child. My name is Ken Morgan. I work at, uh, I'm a special ed teacher at elementary school here in uh, Albuquerque. And um, the thing I think, and, and a lot of people are gonna disagree with this, but um, reading research has shown us a lot about how to teach early readers how to read. And that's one reason we got the No Child Left Behind bill, which didn't work because it didn't have enough teacher training, it didn't have enough resources. But any first grader wants to learn to read. He doesn't care that you're giving him some great literature piece. He wants to learn to read. He wants those skills. He doesn't care if you drill him. He wants to learn to read. We're not getting the job done. In this state, nearly half of our adults are reading at a fifth grade level or lower. And our, our, our proficiency rate in third grade is about 52% of being on grade level. Research shows that we can get 98 to 99% proficiency in third grade in reading with the right instruction and the right intensity. What do we need to make that happen? We need overall more training in research-based methods, which APS is starting to do. We need better licensure program, which Mimi Stewart has done in the legislature to have better licensure tests. And the third thing we need is three new intervention teachers in every elementary school to work with K through three to, in, to get those kids up to grade level by third grade. The difference is, and APS is trying to do this. I gotta give the superintendents office credit because they're trying to get us three more teachers but the legislature won't budge we got to be in the streets we got to make sure that the people understand this and come out and vote to get these teachers in the classroom then we get these kids on grade level by third grade then you don't have all these problems all the way up through mid school and high school because they've already succeeded in third grade 
At the time I did my teacher training, there was a huge amount of emphasis on the teacher's ability to diagnose and prescribe for the ch individual child. And the ideal would be that every teacher would be able to help a child who is a little bit behind in their classroom. What research shows us, though, is that there is no point in retaining a child in the same grade unless there is a remedial program of some sort designed to help that child when he or she is retained. Yes, social promotion. It's understandable that we have a lot of concerns about the plight of the teacher, um, but to exhaust the metaphor, the reality is it's not one kid in a river. It's a whole bunch of kids. And the question is, you know, it, politicians are always going to focus on what they can measure. <clears throat> They're saying to teachers, why don't you get all 30 kids to the river edge? You know, why aren't you saving all of them? Administrators are always going to focus on what they can control. You know, why can't the teacher swim faster? But when we think about where we really lose kids, the kids don't care what the adults are doing on the shore saying, why can't teachers swim faster? If we can focus on how to help the kids and make them understand that what we're doing is relevant, that's relevant. But right now I see an awful lot of times when our system doesn't seem credible to students because we ask them to do things just because we tell them to. I have taught for 32 years and I have seen the same thing for 32 years. And you're gonna throw tomatoes at me. I say a longer school year, a longer school day, remediation programs, okay, and parent programs, which our school is doing. We have parents coming in during the day and getting educated. They don't know that their kid is supposed to know the alphabet and 16 words by the time they hit first grade. How you get to third grade knowing almost nothing, I, re I really don't understand. We also need early intervention, more pre-K, full day pre-K, but who's, how are we going to pay for this? Yes. My name is Lacey Fulbright and I teach at Volcano Vista High School. I'm a high school English teacher. Um, what do we do for those four or five students that aren't hitting the standards at the end of 10th grade? Well, we need to start earlier in that year and identifying you know, where our students come to us from and then helping them to feel confident. By the time they're in 10th grade, if they don't feel like they can read or write for that fact, we need to find something they can do and start linking to that because a lot of students, and I've seen students at my own school, drop out because they have felt like they can't achieve anything. They have no idea how to be successful in school and they've been in school for 10 years. If, we, if as adults we didn't feel successful after 10 years of doing something, we would quit too. So it's about helping them feel and see what they're good at and then building on that, but it starts really early on and it's not about a standardized test. It's about real measurements and getting to know our students by reading and interacting with them on a daily basis. And we can all do that. Now, the point's been made several times and well that this is a different problem at different places along the timeline. When you tell a kid in 11th grade that there's no physical way to finish all the necessary credits and that person is not going to graduate in the 12th grade, that's a form of denial of social promotion. We may call it something else, right? If we tell them, well, there's no way you're going to graduate at the end of 12th grade, we're saying that either you go to 13th grade or you're, you're not graduating high school. I teach at Wallatoa High Charter School, which is located in Jemez Pueblo. Um, one of the things that's that, of, of course, is systemic. It comes from, starts from the beginning. But one of those things is the community and getting community involvement. And one of the big, huge things is we're talking about social promotion. We're talking about class size. I teach at a school with 76 stu students total. And so class size isn't a problem. But if you look at the issues that are going on in that community, on this reservation, you got poverty, you got sexual abuse, physical abuse, you have all of these things that are going on. The last thing on those kids' minds when they get to that school during that day is whether or not they have a quiz. And so being able to create these smaller schools that are more meaningful, more purposeful, is huge. One of the kids that I had that was in ninth grade, selling drugs on the street, kicked out of school, gave God one chance to come back, I referred him for Gates Millennium Scholarship this year. He's going. He's going to Yale. And so for that kid, if, I didn't, if, I, if there was no social promotion at that point, if I couldn't identify him as a person, and if I couldn't identify him and what his, what his skill level was at that point, there's no way he would have gotten to that point and gotten that chance 
to get that scholarship, to go to Yale. And now we're giving them a chance. But we need to have, be able to, we can't do it in a, in a classroom of 45, because I've been in that, in that classroom also, to identify those kids. So there's a whole bunch of things that go into it, and I think of, we've already identified those things. But being able to bring purposeful, meaningful education to kids and being able to be there for them because inherently we're already going to be their counselor, a mom in some cases, a dad in some cases, a brother. We become those things anyway as teachers. So, Well, in your answer, as in many of the answers, is embedded this notion of community involvement, that it's not just you in a room full of kids. There's a wider set of interests and a wider set of inputs. Uh, Tibbetts Middle School from Farmington, New Mexico, so I think I'm probably the farthest away so far. Thanks uh, for driving all this way. Oh, it's, it's worth it. I, um, I'm glad that community involvement came up because our community is wonderful. Um, going back, we have credit recovery courses uh, that the community helps with. Uh, our Boys and Girls Club works with kids all the way up to graduation. Uh, we have counselors at the high, both high schools that really give a darn. When I looked at the data, Farmington has a lower dropout rate than the state of New Mexico, and that's not much, but uh, it's something I think Farmington can be proud of. I've worked in public high schools uh, for eight years, and I want to say that I run a service education program and teach a service leadership class as well. And through service learning, w the research has been definitive now that when we get students out into the community and vice versa when we get community into our schools then the connection that happens to the curriculum for those students and for those kids changes everything for them they start doing better on standardized tests they start being more civically engaged they start attending school more they stay in school if we're talking about the dropout rate service learning has been around for a while now but it's just starting to gain speed and what it does is it creates a moment where a student can go out into a community garden and instead of hearing about photosynthesis they can see it they can they can pick the leaves of a tomato uh, vine and they can smell it and they can see it and then they go wait this is photosynthesis and I'm, I'm gonna take the I'm gonna I know something about meiosis and mitosis and I can't remember what, what she said I'm gonna go tomorrow and I'm gonna learn that because where's the meiosis and mitosis in this right and so all of a sudden we get this and in the name of a community garden which is going to feed the neighborhood people because in the social studies they're learning that there, there's been an industrialization of food and folks from low income can't afford healthy food so here it is growing in their garden but they've connected that now to social studies there's reading math can be the same so this is an important paradigm shift for us to look at how do we get our schools into the community and vice versa there's so many educators out in the community let's tap into those resources uh, one of the things that I, I think is truly important about community is its shared accountability. It's um, sharing that responsibility of education. What we have now is, is further isolation, whether it be um, school choice in, in some respects. I feel like that often takes, uh, takes communities off the hook by, you know, if we, if, if we have students say, oh, well, you know, students and parents say I can I can send my kid here because this is a failing school then we're, we're essentially taking that community off the hook and there's there's not that opportunity to invest in that community as a whole my name is Kevin Kirby I work in Bernalillo Public Schools uh, I'm dual certified in special education and social studies um, I teach New Mexico history um, sometimes the community is right in our school one of the janitors happens to be he's Diné and we study the Navajo reservations, we study the impact on New Mexico. Then I find out that he's dedicated buildings here in Albuquerque. Then I find out that he's presented in places all over the world. So this is a gentleman who is pushing a broom in my school. And I wanted the kids to be able to see that this community member had something to offer. Yes. At my school, luckily, we have an after-school program that's supported by the city. However, most of those end at 415 to 430. Um, I think there needs to be a larger amount allocated to those after-school hours. Um, different programs, not just homework help and, and all of that. In the back. 
we have to open the doors. So when we say community, it takes community to raise a child. It really does. And it really means having to stay as open up at 6.30 in the morning and staying till 7.30 and talking to our families. It really means that that's the time they can come. We educate those parents to say, you know what? This is how we navigate the system. Our parents out there don't know how to navigate anything unless we educate them there. We don't train our parents, we educate them. We educate our community to say, you know what? We can do it. We can change the way we are.